this and share it, you know, so I'll share it with everyone who teaches right now. Thanks, timetabling. Uh, right, so uh, Mary Robinson is uh, a graduate student at NYU finishing up her PhD in sociosyntax. Um, she's also recently started working at the University of Glasgow as a research assistant under Jen Smith with the uh, Scott Syntax Atlas. Um, so it does a lot of thinking about uh, both syntactic formal theory and then uh, how we actually square that with linguistic variation. And so today she's going to tell us a little bit about that. Mary, I can't hear you. I can hear a crackling, but I can't hear a voice. I don't know whether anyone else is getting that. Right, we're, we're trying to sort that. Oh, it's like, I, just, I, I want to, you know, I can hear something <laughs> no, the, is happening. It's not dead. There's just, no, just, no, the, the crackling is is something. There's, there's, is there still a crackling or you can hear me? Yeah, still okay. crackling. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can hear you, but it might be through Dan's microphone. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, if you had Bluetooth headphones attached, sometimes Windows doesn't like them and you have to just check the little next to your microphone button, the little arrow, if it's using the right microphone. Um, mine keeps doing that. This microphone, is that working? Is that okay? The computer tells me it's okay and you guys are saying it's okay too? We got you. Oh. Then there was a very long echo. Okay. Great. Whew. Hopefully this will go all right and I won't have too many sound issues. I wanted to plug in the headphones so that there wasn't a bunch of weird echoing between me and Dan and then it just messed up my microphone. So sorry about that. Okay. Um, I will just share my screen. Okay, and then Great. Does that work? So it looks like full screen? Okay. Hi, sorry for the technical problems. I'm a lot, use, a lot less used to a Zoom than probably a lot of you guys here. Um, but I am excited to present my dissertation work to you. Um, and this is uh, essentially what I can say of my dissertation in about 40 to 50 minutes. So uh, the title is Negative Concord is Window into the Social Perception of morphosyntactic variables. Um, so I want to start at a point in sociolinguistics um, about the sociolinguistic perception of variation. And we know that listeners make social judgments about speakers based on, for example, the phonological and morphological variants used by the speakers. So for example, Southern American English has been shown in multiple studies to be rated as less intelligent, less educated, less correct, but also more pleasant. And that's both by uh, in-group listeners and out-group listeners. Um, also in the morphological realm, the use of in over ing um, has been rated as less professional. The more you use it, the less professional you sound. So of course, being a syntactician in sociolinguistics, I was asking, what about syntactic variation? And the sort of received wisdom is that syntactic variation is somehow qualitatively different than phonological or morphological variation. This is a really long held assumption in the sociolinguistic literature. And as far as I can tell, it goes, some people are like, well, it's because Bill said so. And that's not a great reason. Um, but the thing that like Bill said that everyone keeps repeating is that syntactic variation takes place at a somewhat more abstract level than phonological or morphological variation. Although what that means is never really uh, explained thoroughly. And then purported evidence for this assumption is that syntactic variables are seldom socially stratified but if you do find a syntactic variable that seems to be socially stratified, then it's usually analyzed as being lexical. So the argumentation can start to get quite circular, where it's like, okay, if it is socially stratified, that doesn't mean syntactic variables are socially stratified. That means this one must be lexical. Um, so how are you supposed to find uh, socially stratified syntactic variables then? So, um, it's a big research question in my dissertation is, is syntactic variation socially evaluated? 
Um, and then that opens up a couple other pretty big questions. Uh, what do we mean by social evaluation? What do we mean by syntactic variation? And how can we test this experimentally? So um, social evaluation, I like to use this uh, short and sweet definition from uh, Catherine Campbell Kibler, that social abilities are uh, speaker production in a way that reflects their social characteristics, listener perception, and social ideologies about forms. When I talk about social evaluation, I'm mostly just focusing on perception. Uh, and when I talk about things uh, being perceived as less educated, I'm only looking at the perception side of things here. In terms of syntactic variation, um, I found that there are at least two distinct phenomenon that can fall under what sociolinguists generally call syntactic variation. Um, one of these I'm gonna call sort of informally variation in word order, a bit more formally variation in the narrow syntax, and I'll show an example of that. And the other kind is variation in the pronunciation of morphemes, or more formally variation in the spell out. So how does that look? Well, in terms of syntactic variation, if we have uh, the particle verb alternation in English, for example, I took out the trash versus I took the trash out, then we can say it's a syntactic variable in part if we adopt the analysis from Haddockin and Johnson, you can say there are two different syntactic trees. And I took out the trash where out is highlighted in red. We see that the P head actually head moves all the way up to adjoin to the uh, pred head. Versus I took the trash out, the P head moves up once to the little P, um, but basically stays in place, does not move over the object. So these are two syntactic variants in that they mean almost the same thing, but the syntax is actually different. And this is uh, compared to morphosyntactic variation, which um, I want to say is variation in the production of morphemes. So if we take this example from MBIC 2008, um, we have this one tree that has dive plus past tense. So the key here is that the syntactic tree doesn't change at all. There are just two different ways of pronouncing dive plus past tense. You can either pronounce it as dove if as in the Dove grammar B, you have dive on a special list of like exceptional verbs that takes a zero ending, or you can have dived if like in the dived grammar, you don't have dive on that list. And so the default rule applies. But the key thing I wanna uh, highlight between these two things is that one involves a difference in the syntax and the other involves how you pronounce the syntactic nodes. Um, and one really key point that I want to make um, is that how do we tell if something is morphological or syntactic variation? Um, I strongly think that's a question of theory. And when you say that uh, a variable syntactic, that entails that you're making a claim about the syntax of the variance. And I think you have to use this as a starting point if you want to avoid circular reasoning of is this lexical or is it syntactic, and then using social stratification to judge that. So uh, for this talk, here's a little roadmap. Uh, I wanted to explore these questions of syntactic variation and social evaluation through a case study of negative concord. So the first sort of third, I'll go through some variationist work. And I want to highlight the variationist work in the sense is really important because it gives a more complete understanding of the variable. And it informs the morphosyntactic theory of each variant or the theory of the variation. Then I'm going to present um, a morphosyntactic theory that's part of joint work with Gary Toms, where we try to account for the morphology and the syntax of the negative concord variants. So there will be a, a syntactic part and a morphological part. And the morphosyntactic theory part is really important because it informs the design of the perception experiment so that we can be really clear about what we wanna test beforehand. And that way our results actually hold weight. And finally, I want to present the perception experiment where I tested the perception of morphological and syntactic variables within the umbrella of negative concord. And there is some evidence of social evaluation of syntactic negative concord variation. So I think that's very exciting. Um, so let's go. So first, we're just gonna define the variable a little bit. What is negative concord? Who says it, et cetera. Um, so just to make sure we're all on absolutely the same page and I'm not using any weird or confusing terminology, um, negative concord, is going to be abbreviated NC, and it means multiple negative morphemes, but only one semantic negation, such as I didn't see nothing. Um, the items that participate in negative concord items or can contribute to semantic negation by themselves, I'm going to call negative concord items or NCIs, such as nothing, nobody, nowhere, 
And then items licensed under negation are negative polarity items or NPI, such as anything, anybody, anywhere. Um, so negative concord is present in English, although it's excluded from the so-called standard. Um, it is attested in 80% of English varieties. Um, and the varieties of interest to me are a lot of cross UK colloquial data, more or less, and then uh, a few select US dialects. So there are a couple different syntactic configurations of negative concord that I'd like to talk through. The first, I'm calling object negative concord, um, although it isn't always necessarily with an object, it just means post-verbal. So it's concord between sentential negation and a post-verbal negative indefinite. We have examples here from Bucky, Northern England, Reading, um, Southern England, and across the US. Um, usually, if you can find negative concord in a dialect, you will find object negative concord. Um, next, we have what I'm calling subject negative concord, but it's really concord between the sentential negation and the pre-verbal negative indefinite, um, such as no one didn't see after him. So this is found some places in England and uh, in Appalachian English, Southern White American English, and African American language. So it's much more limited than our object negative concord was. And then negative auxiliary inversion, which I'm going to abbreviate N. AI. Um, so this is concord between a fronted sentential negation and a negative indefinite subject, such as wasn't nothing much she could say, won't nobody help her, didn't nobody laugh. It's found in a handful of American dialects um, and hasn't been found or hasn't really been attested uh, on the British Isles. Hmm. So those are the three syntactic constructions uh, of interest here. Um, in terms of morphological variation, of negative concord. Um, there are a lot of interesting insights from variationist work. Um, so one, the key takeaway here is that NCI and MPI determiners seem to be somewhat sensitive to their noun in a way that we don't quite understand yet because there's a lot of conflicting evidence. So for example, within the British National Corpus, Anderwald found that the negative concord pair unt no, like there wasn't no books, uh, had much higher token count than int nothing, and uh, int nobody or no one only had 12 tokens across the entire BNC. Um, Jen Smith in, found almost the opposite thing in Bucky, Scotland, where nothing and no one were twice as common as something like no books and no fish. And then in England, there's another piece of the puzzle <laughs> that a group of adolescent girls studied by Jenny Tesher uh, use nothing over anything at a rate of 27%, they use no something over any something at a rate of 80%. So they did seem to vary independently of the noun or somehow be sensitive to the noun, kind of unclear. Um, and finally, in Alabama, rates of no for any are actually higher than rates of never forever. Um, as we probably know, or can at least guess, uh, negative concord use varies substantially by what social group is talking and who they're talking to and what they're talking about. But um, in some studies, we see that um, in LeBov's 1972 study of Harlem teen males, the rates of negative concord are between 90 and 97 percent, so quite high. In uh, Anniston, Alabama, among the white working class, uh, rates are 60 to almost 90 percent, so still quite high, but less than the AAL. And then the uh, white upper class in Anniston, Alabama, never use negative concord, so it's uh, very stratified by class. There's also a substantial amount of individual variation though. So for example, um, Fagan has interviews with Sue Taylor and in three different instances, Sue uses three different rates of negative concord. In an interview, 45%, in a second interview, only 17%, but in, in informal reporting as high as 78%. Um, and then Fagan also gives the example of MJ who has an overall rate of nearly 90% negative concord, but most of that rate comes from using no for any, whereas the speaker almost never uses never forever. So there's a lot of individual variation going on there. In addition, we find a lot of intra-speaker variation between any and no. And I wanna highlight that a lot of these um, are by the same speaker, or rather all of these examples are by the same speaker, but two out of the three of these are in the same utterance. So we have from a podcast, someone said, couldn't come up with nothing, didn't see anything. Uh, we have from Blanchett in Appalachian English, I didn't have no lice, I didn't have any itch. So exactly the same context, just replacing no with any. 
Um, and then we have Julia Kay from Aniston saying, wasn't nothing you all liked and didn't anybody. So one speaker can change between these forms. Um, we also find intro speaker uh, mixing of negative concordance and MPIs, especially what looks like skipping possible targets of Concord. So for example, we never had any luck there, neither. We're never in neither in Concord, but for some reason, any is skipped. Way back yonder, didn't anybody have nothing then? And I don't want anything no more. So there's an any token in the middle and a lot of syntactic accounts would, per, uh, would predict that that wouldn't be possible. So um, as we move toward a theoretical account of this, uh, we wanna sort of review what we've seen and say that that is what the uh, account should be able to account for. So uh, there are at least three different syntactic configurations, object negative concord, subject negative concord, uh, negative auxiliary inversion. Although not all of those configurations are available in all dialects. Um, there's an item-based variability in the realization of negative concord, and there are the influence of extra linguistic factors. So I'll give a pretty brief uh, account of negative concord in English. Feel free to ask me more questions about it later. Um, so this is joint work with uh, one of my advisors, Gary Toms. And what we wanna say about the syntax of negative concord is that basically you have a neg P that's gonna merge really low with the uh, lowest negative element and then move higher in the syntax, usually just below T. So we get the morphological variability because this neg, as it goes along, it stops off in the specifier of um, sorry, different phrases and agrees with the head in a spec head agreement. And then through variable spell out rules, um, we get the negative concord or NPI form. So um, in, I didn't see nothing, for example, we have the neg P merge low with any or no thing, then the neg P raises up. And this uh, D head has a polarity feature valued at neg and can either be spelled out as any or no. And I'll show that competition in a couple of slides. Uh, for subject negative concord, we have um, our negative uh, DP, nobody, and it starts in the first merge subject position, moves up to the specifier of sigma P, and then moves up to the specifier of TP, the canonical subject position, um, and is always pronounced nobody. And then we have negative auxiliary inversion, didn't nobody take the bus. It looks a lot like the subject negative concord, except here. We have uh, the head movement of sigma to join onto T, the T head to make a complex head, then that complex head moves over to C. Um, and we th think of this as a polarity driven T to C movement, uh, possibly driven by this C pole. Although we'll see. <laughs> um, so in terms of how we actually get the no versus any, um, we have this plus F feature, which basically creates the right conditioning environments um, for us. So we have our any grammar, which basically says when I'm C commanded by a copy of neg P plus F, I'm going to be realized as any. So that makes sure that any never appears without a negative before it. Um, and otherwise it's realized as no. Versus the no grammar, which just realizes the head always as no, and that's when we get the negative concord grammar. So the idea is that these two grammars compete. Um, the any grammar is going to sometimes produce any, sometimes produce no, the no grammar is going to always produce no. And that's how we get these variable rates. So what resolves the competition between these grammars? Uh, I'm gonna follow Embic and saying that there's some probability P that um, a grammar will be chosen. It's going to vary based on extra linguistic factors, vary between zero and one, and that speakers are going to set this probability P during the language acquisition stage by just listening to the adults around them and listening to at what rates they use negative concord or not, and then they will adjust it uh, based on the social context. This does make the prediction that, for example, any and no variation are independent of the rates of never and ever variation. And we do see that borne out with our speaker MJ that I mentioned before, who has a high rate of usage of negative concord, but um, much of that is no for any as opposed to never forever. Um, and in this way, uh, when we have these mixed chains, that's actually not surprising because if 
each item has its own competition, you would expect things like I didn't do anything no more. <clears throat> so um, in terms of negative concord as morphological and syntactic variation, I wanna say that the umbrella of negative concord includes syntactic variation. So there are three different syntactic configurations of interest to me here. They are object negative concord, subject negative concord, negative auxiliary inversion. And that if we want to see two variants that really vary with each other, that would be subject negative concord, negative auxiliary inversion. And that the syntax that underlies both of those is that one has uh, an optional head movement of T to C and the other doesn't. Otherwise, they have the same syntax, but there's extra movement in one. Um, I want to say that negative concord also includes morphological variation. And this is when you have the same syntactic structures, but it's variably pronounced as any or no, depending on the competition between the grammars of vocabulary insertion. So all of that is building up to setting the conditions for the perception experiment. Um, so I wanted to see how people perceive different types of negative concord. So this uh, experiment had a three by two design. There were three syntactic conditions, object, subject, negative auxiliary inversion, there were two morphological conditions, uh, negative concord versus NPI. And then that led to six test conditions total. Um, and you can see them here and examples of each sort of thing. Um, the experiment was a written survey on Qualtrics and the participants were recruited and paid through a prolific. So the hypotheses for this experiment. So the first one was, are morphological and syntactic variants evaluated differently <laughs> with respect to social attributes. Uh, my hypothesis is yes, but also that the morphological variants will have a stronger effect size and that's how they will differ. The research question too was, does the syntactic configuration in which negative concord is used affect perceptions of social attributes? And my hypothesis, contra the null hypothesis is that the syntactic configuration does affect perceptions of social attributes. So, We'll see how that went for me. Um, for the participants for this study, um, I targeted people from five dialect groups and I, target, I got 15 people from each group. Um, for the UK, I wanted people uh, from Tyneside, from York, close to the city of York. And from the US, I wanted speakers of mainstream US English, Southern white American English and African American language. Now, by targeting people through these geographic and social factors, I'm not guaranteeing that they are speakers of these dialects but this is probably the best chance that I can get to get those kinds of speakers. And if they were born and raised in these dialect areas, I assume that these speakers have heard the constructions of negative concord that I was showing to them. So um, the stimuli, they were four sentence written stories about playing games as a child. The participants were told that the stories were excerpts from spoken interviews. And they were asked to rate each one on uh, a seven point semantic differential scale for the traits of intelligence, class, friendliness, and education level. There were six target items for each of the six conditions. There were two baseline items for each end of each scale. So baseline of like, all you should get from this is that this person's really friendly. All you should get from this example is that this person's really lower class. So that I could sort of like show them what the end of that, those scales were. And then there were five fillers for each of four distractor linguistic conditions. Two of these were morphological, the Northern subject rule, and third singular S absence. Two were syntactic, needs washed, and have raising. So it was 72 items total. It was a lot. They were paid a lot, I promise. And they were encouraged to take breaks after every 12. So it took a bit, but they were wonderful participants. Okay, so here's what that looks like. Um, this is an example of the object negative concord condition where you just see something speaker. I was the opposite of my brother. I was a good kid. I didn't bother nobody. All the neighbors liked me. And then I asked them, how would you rate the speaker on these scales? Part of the idea being that they're going to read this in their own head, hopefully in their own accent, and this will help them determine how it sounds. Um, so there were a lot of results. Um, because I divided them up by trait, by group. So it was a lot of different categories there. But I ran linear mixed effects regression with a random effect of item order and participant. And um, just as a heads up, I'm not going to discuss perceived friendliness ratings 
um, too many of these models were either not significant or failed to converge, and there's no really meaningful interpretation of results that I can get for them at this stage. So we're looking just at the other three. So in terms of morphology, just comparing the morphological conditions, negative concord versus MPI, and collapsing across the syntactic conditions, all the participant groups rated negative concord as uh, speakers of negative concord or speakers as significantly less educated, less intelligent, and lower class than the NPI condition. Um, you can see sort of a visualization of that here, and all of these differences uh, were significant. It's always pretty clear, pretty robust, and completely unsurprising. We really expect that, we know that negative concord is incredibly stigmatized, so this is just confirming that experimentally. <laughs> so then, in terms of syntax, what I did is I compared the syntactic conditions within a subset of only negative concord items. So I'm only comparing object negative concord to subject negative concord to negative auxiliary inversion with negative concord. For these models, the baseline was subject negative concord because subject negative concord and negative auxiliary inversion were the closest things. Remember, they were just separated by head movement. And so I thought if anything was going to show clear results and show that it was just the syntactic movement that was causing these differences, it would be that comparison. So we do find some significant results there. Um, negative auxiliary inversion when compared to subject negative concord is perceived as less intelligent by people from the Muse, that's mainstream US English, Tyne and York groups. Um, in addition, uh, negative auxiliary inversion is perceived as less educated uh, by the Muse and York participants, again, when compared to subject negative concord. And what I thought was interesting is that it trends towards significance for the AAL participants as well, which was somewhat unexpected. And finally, um, negative auxiliary reversion is perceived as lower class by only the AAL and MUSE participants, not by any of the other ones. That was the only significant class finding. So um, what I wanted to say about this is, if we think back to the variation work I showed, um, there are dialect groups where this sort of inversion is just not found, such as York and Tyne. I said negative auxiliary inversion is not really on the British islands. Um, so it was interesting then to see that these groups actually had a more fine-grained uh, view of their social perception of it. Uh, they perceived uses of this construction as less educated and less intelligent, not always. But that was a general finding for mainstream US English, unsurprisingly, negative auxiliary inversion um, was found to be less educated, less intelligent. Um, negative auxiliary inversion is robustly attested in AAL, but among these participants in the study, it was rated as significantly lower class and almost significantly less educated. Um, although negative auxiliary inversion is also attested in Southern white American English, there were no significant differences in the perception of social attitudes. The baseline was significantly um, below zero. So they all thought, yes, these people are less intelligent, less educated, lower class, but they didn't make any finer grain distinction between the syntactic conditions. So just wrapping up everything that I've shown you, um, in terms of variations work on a negative concord, I showed that there are three different syntactic uh, negative concord syntactic configurations of interest here, object negative concord, subject negative concord, negative auxiliary inversion, that there is significant interest speaker variation in the use of negative concord items versus MPIs. Um, I presented a morphosyntactic account of this sort of variation where the negation merges low and raises in the syntax to just below T, um, that the two variants that really resemble each other, subject negative concord and negative auxiliary inversion, are distinguished by T to C head movement and that the morphological variability that we find is due to competing spell grammars. And then I used all this to form a perception experiment. And I did in fact find different results for morphological versus syntactic variation. Um, morphological variation does in fact have a larger effect size that is consistent across all participant groups. And we do see that some groups do show sensitivity to negative auxiliary immersion, but the results are not exactly uniform. So just returning to the research questions I laid out before, um, is syntactic variation socially evaluated? My answer is sometimes there were some significant results. So it's a start. Um, and there's a lot more to do here. But um, I think what's really key is what's needed to tell is a theory of the syntax of the variance, that that has to be the starting point if we are going to say anything about the social evaluation of syntactic variation at all. Great. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing or just make it small. Other questions? <laughs> Sorry, I can't, I can't see. Should I, should I stop sharing so that I can see people? Okay. Oh. Um. Yeah, you can stop sharing if you want or pull up slides as people want if they've got questions for you, anything like that. Um, I'm going to stay on mute because we're in the same room. But if anyone has questions, I'm sure Mary can take her own. Yeah, Andres? Oh, you're muted. Anders, you're muted. Can't hear you. Anders, I can't hear you. Okay, you can hear me now. Yes, uh, perfect. So how did you um, uh, how did you tell them what you know what lower class means? Wasn't that a problem? Did people immediately know what you meant when you said lower class? On a scale of lower to higher class. Um, so one of the exclusion criteria was um, looking at things like just the baselines, things that should be at one end of the scale or the other. So I had lower class and higher class baselines. And if people rated too many of them in the middle or on the wrong end of the scale, I excluded them from the study. So they had to have some idea that was somewhat the same as mine of lower class and higher class. And the lower class ones for the baselines, it was just people saying like, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. So we didn't have many toys or for upper class. It was like, we took a ton of vacations and I had a huge room full of toys. I guess you never notice when you have everything or something like that. So it was really, I tried to make it very clearly about material wealth mm -hmm. as opposed to anything else when I was drawing out a uh, lower class and upper class. Jeff? Yeah, so back to some really interesting stuff, Mary. Um, a, a sort of data and theory question, I guess. Um, with the with the subject negative concord and the negative auxiliary inversion, do you actually ever get um, negative concord items realized there? Do you ever get like anybody didn't come or didn't anybody come? And if not, is that predicted by your theory in some way? Because your um, your competing grammars thing just seemed very free. So I was like, is there a distinction, and is that predicted. Yep. Um, so yes, this is part of the thing that uh, Gary and I are still working on now. It's kind of driving us crazy. So um, I'm going to pull up the slides again, just to go back to one um, that does relate to this. Sorry, let me just share this um, screen. Share that. Okay. So um, the negative auxiliary version with NPI is couldn't anybody see him? That is attested in Southern White American English, Appalachian English, and AAL to a lesser extent. So that is something that people do say, right. and not as a question. Yeah, yeah. So, right. so for some groups that should be grammatical, and that was the that one. Um, and then uh, anybody didn't or anybody couldn't. Um, some Irish English does allow that. So part of the thing is that I'm going to stop sharing for one second. We really want the system to be quite flexible because when you look across a bunch of different dialects, they can do kind of crazy things. And that is in part why we have this little feature F, which basically creates the right conditioning environments. Yeah. And so when feature F is um, minus, then it means like basically that the NEGP can't escape from the DP. So it has to all travel up together. And that's how we get it. So um, it all travels up to, for example, the subject position together. And then it also says, oh, by the way, this has to be pronounced as no. Right. So that's how we rule up anybody didn't. Although in the case of Irish Englishes, we would have to say something else like, okay, well, they must also have, you know, uh, this feature sometimes. Yeah. Um, and in terms of couldn't anybody it's interesting because in dialects that have couldn't anybody do it, they still don't have anybody couldn't. So there has to be some really careful rules about that. And honestly, we haven't figured the details of that one out quite yet. 
but that's an important place to go. But but yeah, in general, we need it to be incredibly free because we see such variability across English dialects. Hannah? Uh, that was really great. I have two questions, if that's okay. Um, yeah. First one is more specific. Um, were the the sentences in the perception experiment were they designed to was was there any kind of link between the actual content of the sentence and how people judge them? So not just the grammatical features, like what were they actually describing? Because I, I just in the one you mentioned, it mentioned something about like being a good kid or being a naughty kid or something like that. Yeah. Um, I can't say for sure. I was very careful in writing the stimuli because I know that there is work on the production of negative concord. For example, Emma Moore's work or Penny Eckert's work. They say that people use negative concord to sort of perform being delinquent, mm -hmm. right? And so I was very aware of that. And so actually what I tried really hard to do is in every instance where there was negative concord, I had the kid talk either neutral or something good about themselves. I tried to never do it like I was in trouble. Nice. I was very conscious to control for that. Yeah. That doesn't mean that it didn't affect people. Mm -hmm. You know, because if someone was like, I was better than my brother, they're like, oh, your brother's bad. Maybe you're bad too. Like, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Um, and then if, if there were sentences about getting in trouble, uh, for example, it was always with the, either a test sentence sorry, um, uh, a filler or something, yeah. or it was with the any. Cool. Just to try to like challenge people to think in slightly different ways. I don't know how it worked. Cool. I think it'd be kind of hard to tell, but, but yes, that, that was taken into consideration yeah. that I didn't want like the kids being like, I didn't do nothing. The principal was yelling at me. Cause that doesn't, <laughs> that's just playing into stereotypes at that point. It, it won't yeah. really be informative. No, it sounds really good. It's so well thought through. And my other question is kind of, I don't know whether it's, it's be welcome or not welcome, but I'd just love to know what you want to do next. What, what huh. do you think it might go next? Because it, it's just there, really about it. So I said I did a perception experiment. There were four parts. The first part was a screener study where I got all their demographic info. The second part was a grammaticality study so I could then actually compare what was in their grammar and then see how they perceived it. Then there was a perception study. And then I asked them a more informal attitudes survey where I just gave them these explicit examples like I couldn't do anything I couldn't do nothing and I was like and I gave them a scale one to five I would say this to no speaker of English would say this as sort of like a usage slash like distancing like social distancing sort of scale and then it, each one had a follow-up like if you couldn't say this what kind of people say this because I, I thought that after seeing all these examples they probably were thinking at least subconsciously if not consciously about negative concord so I just asked them like what speaking, what uh, speech community do you consider yourself a part of? Do people in your community say that? So these people did so much work. <laughs> I'm very grateful to NYU for the funding to pay them. <laughs> um, yeah, so they were super participants, but because it's just been so much data, I haven't gotten around to all these things, but there, there are really interesting sort of constellations to draw between what people said was grammatical, how they perceived it, mm -hmm. and then what they said their explicit ideologies were about those things. And those are all sort of different and sometimes a bit contradictory and confusing. So, yeah, there, there's like, still a lot of yeah, a, a couple like papers are, to come out of it if I can analyze it. <laughs> if you, it sounds like you are trying to untangle the most complicated of webs very well, but it sounds incredibly complicated. I mean, right, it's not, I think the dissertation is probably just going to have the perception stuff and then everything else, it's just going to be, you know for future research yeah, cool. <laughs> or like as like little pilots to build on in very specific ways I so I wanted to get all the because I, I have presented some of this stuff in the past especially MIU and some of the things I got from syntacticians were well you can't say how like what their perception was because you don't know what was in their grammar and what wasn't and some of the feedback I got from sociolinguists were well you can't say what their perception was because you don't know their ideologies about language <laughs> So like you can never please both. So I tried really hard to like bookend it with these other okay. surveys so I could at least have more context. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. William, did you have a question? You're on mute. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It was very good to hear about your research, uh, what is going to be in your PAC. I have, I think, a question, perhaps a, a remark. One question is, um, 
uh, you have a system, of course, so there is um, the underlying grammar for the different varieties. I'm just wondering, uh, do those um, underlying grammars also cover any other phenomena in those varieties? Or, of course, well, perhaps the uh, grammars were set up specifically to account for the negative concord data. But I'm just wondering, so because um, yep. it's, ideally it should not be just a case of, well, there's negative concord uh, in this language or in this variety of this particular type, and that is because this or that rule operates. And the other variety doesn't have that because that rule does not operate, and that's the end of the story. So I'm, I was wondering a bit about that. And my remark concerns um, it's just uh, uh, some historical data that uh, uh, are interesting, in particular in connection with this subject, uh, negative concord. So in uh, dialects of Old English, uh, there's one dialect which has this subject negative concord. Uh, certain other dialects do not have it. So that's just interesting uh, sort of parallel data, but there's variation there too. And I think also in the history of Spanish, so I think Spanish today does not have a subject negative concord, but it used to have it. So that also you should talk with um, uh, there's some people in the School of Modern Languages working on this. There's an M Lit student. Uh, yeah, that's right. But I've, I've written on that as well, Vim, actually. Um, hmm. Subject negative concord in medieval Spanish. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So look at uh, Jeff's uh, earlier work. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that was my sort of observation. Yeah. Um, so about can these grammars cover other phenomenon? Yes, <laughs> theoretically, yes. Uh, one thing that we're trying to tie this to is more long distance sort of movement. Um, that also has to do with negative concord, but there is another type that I didn't include in this talk, which is long distance negative concord, um, which in some Appalachian English, Southern white American English and AAL can cross clause boundaries. Um, and in some cases, especially in AAL, it can cross relative clause boundaries. So there's something there about the islandhood of relative clauses uh, in terms of this, like, I don't know, semantic or syntactic properties of their head. That is something that we're working on. <laughs> it's a lot of, of theory to like, I'll have one paper, but we are, uh, Gary and I are, are working on that. And that's something that we want to include. So we're uh, focusing a bit more on the long distance stuff and, and what that ties to as well, if that explains it a bit. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Andres? Andres, yeah. did you have a question? Yeah, 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 yeah. good. Yeah, um, uh, it was interesting that uh, the negative auxiliary inversion and Southern American English Mm -hmm. where they didn't think there was anything special about it, right? Wasn't they, they thought it was okay. Right. They, wasn't, that, wasn't that what you found? Well, they rated all the negative concord conditions as like worse than baseline. So like generally they're like, these are, you know, these people are less educated, less intelligent. Um, it has been attested in Southern white American English. It doesn't mean that it's accepted. I the people didn't make fine grained distinctions that negative auxiliary inversion is worse than the other kinds. That's true. Uh -huh. I was a bit surprised to find that. Um, I have no idea why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was unexpected, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, and I don't know if it was that like some of their ratings were already like kind of so low that they couldn't go lower. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, but they, they were unhappy with it, so I don't know exactly why it was. Uh -huh. That it wasn't lower than the other ones. Yeah. Can you, show, can you show us that slide again? With sorry, with sorry. Yes, I can. Yeah. Um, let me share my screen. Again. Um. So that slide was. Oh, uh, sort of all three of these. That here you have that Southern White American English. Um everything is is like below this sort of right. neutral. This is intelligence, but 
these three don't differ significantly from each other. Okay. Um, and where, 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 there was a slide where you had, well, like, uh, Southern American English came out differently from the others. Um, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. There was this one, it's just morphology and everybody thinks negative concords worse. Yeah. And then there were three syntax slides. So I think I mentioned that empirically, we, we see that Southern White American English does have negative auxiliary inversion. So I don't know why their ratings were, were so similar. Right. Hmm. That's this one. And then there was this one with Southern uh, White American English in terms of education level, perceived education level. Um, they all sort of clustered together. The syntactic conditions aren't significantly different from each other. And then the last one um, was class and Southern white American English doesn't have any of the syntactic conditions significantly different from each other. Um, I mentioned on this slide that it's a tested, but, but there are no really significant differences in perception of social attributes. I see. All right. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not sure why. Okay. So it wasn't quite so interesting. Hmm? So it wasn't quite so interesting as I thought. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Joaquin? Yeah, first time I used that race hunt thing, and I think it looks awful, it looks very imposing. <laughs> sorry. Um, but um, yeah, great talk. And also, like, long time no see. And I, 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 I've done so much this since. This is what I've last... been doing. Uh, yeah, like you've done so much, and it's it's really good. And I just think like this type of research is 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 really needed because there is work on morphosyntactic syntactic variation, but not that much about perception. Where in reality, you speak to people, and it it is a thing, um, but it needs to be empirically like validated or supported. So yeah, great. That's uh, I think it's needed. Um, you must have read uh, stuff by Claire Childs, like great part of her yep. research is on negative concord and like negative negation in general. And Karen as well has done a, a, lot, of, a lot on it. But I think um, not to the depth of this perception side of it. And it's great because even in this course, pragmatists will find the same thing. Like they are flagged up like in society, but it's not empirically evidenced. So yeah. Um, I think that was, yeah, that was great. And I don't really have any question. I just, uh, yeah, want to say that it's, yeah, I'm thank grateful you. that you're doing this stuff because it's, it's, yeah, it's needed. Um, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you understand with this course, Pragmatic, that like, it's so important. People really care about what you say and how you say it. And we just don't have the empirical data yet. Um, exactly. The thing about morphosyntax is that it's really that people are like, oh, well, this is clearly a structural variable. And I'm like, what do you mean clearly? Like, you haven't said anything about the syntax. Um, so that was part of the thing is that I wanted to do these perception experiments, but I was like, I literally can't if I don't know exactly what I'm comparing. If I can't tell what, mm -hmm. like how the syntax is different, then what do the results mean? They mean nothing. Um, so yeah, it's just that I went into sociolinguistics and I don't yeah. do sounds. That's, that's what happened. <laughs> I don't do sounds yeah, at all. Yeah, so that's... this is what I, this is what I have. Yeah, and uh, with the comment that um, uh, William, I think, said about uh, Spanish, yeah, we do have as a standard negative concord. We need both yep. negations, uh, but yeah, it doesn't happen in subject. Uh, so, and I don't think there's much variation in that sense. I don't know, like um, you were mentioned, like, I've never heard anyone, I've never, like in any, I don't know, like TV series or whatever, like anything where you look, lis listen to other dialects and stuff, never see anything like, yeah, having, something that some variation there i wonder if in the states there is some influence from the hispanic population in that sense with negative concord because it is the standard in spanish we cannot not do it basically uh well we can i mean it's not grammatical or um, yeah which is why when i was recruiting participants i like felt awful being like monolingual english please mm. but also i was like if you have influence it's such a negative concord, such a normal thing and then it's really stigmatized in english and so if you have influence of other languages, then you're probably going to think it's it's more normal because yeah. it is. Um, yeah, so it will be interesting to see those effects. I just needed something to build a foundation to do that version. And then that would be something that's really, really interesting. It's like 
especially in communities where they speak more than one language and one of them is negative concord exactly. are the this is a stigma less mm -hmm. that would be really interesting to see well thank yeah. you thanks andreas hi. hi thanks so much for the talk mary i really enjoyed it although i kind of yeah signed off for the trees i think that's <laughs> not so much like i just have another i tried to make that as not scary that. as possible by being like look it <laughs> me. okay moving on <laughs> um, i was just wondering when you designed the perceptual experiments if because i'm assuming again i don't know so much about it but i'm assuming at least in production data i guess there is some sort of variation right so negative concord doesn't happen 100 of the time there is both options if like if that was part of, I mean, obviously this is quite difficult to implement in a design like that, but did you ever wonder, you know, should I include frequency and will people pick up on frequency? Cause you know, there's this whole sociolinguistic monitor thing. Um, so yeah, I was just wondering. Yes. Oh yes, that is a very good question. And my original dissertation proposal had that and it was like, okay, I'm gonna do this crazy experiment which like I just told you what I had to pay the participants for. They did so much. And that was just having like, yes or no. I, I really wanted to do like, okay, there are five possible tokens, but it's like 0%, <laughs> like 20%, 40%, just like with uh, Le Beau Vidal, uh 2011, where they do, you know, increasing numbers of in versus ing. I really wanted to do that. Um, it was uh, delusions of grandeur. It was not <laughs> something that was going to work out in this experiment. Hopefully, uh, now that I have some baseline information, I will be able to use something like that in the future. That's a really good question. I think it would be interesting to see how sensitive people are, like how many tokens it takes to get people to really start judging. So what, what other variables could there be to look at uh, for syntactic variation, right? Ooh, so... Um, English doesn't have that much it syntax. It has a couple, variation. it has a couple. Um, and it's clearly in a point where there is lots. But, um, so Dan will know some of, something about this, but um, something like needs washed would be really, really interesting. And needs yeah. washed, needs to be washed. Yeah, needs washing. Needs washing. Yeah, yeah, there is that. Yeah. There you have to tease apart the morphological from the syntactic. Uh -huh. Um, but that was one of the filler conditions for the experiment. The other filler condition was have raising, which is not in American English and reads as very proper. Oh, thanks, Anna. Um, it reads as very proper and very British. Okay. Um, so there's something, and I was just clicking through some of the experiment to get the screenshot to show you guys. And it was like, I was so lonely as a kid because I hadn't any friends. And like, that sounds hilarious to Americans. You're just like, oh, you're, you're quite proper, aren't you? I had not quite friends. proper to me. <laughs> yeah, well, fair. fair. That's fair, but I mean, that would be that would be another one. Um, yeah, that would have been another one in the 1950s or something, but... but yeah. I, There's know. also um, the preposition of alternation, which uh, Laurel McKenzie and I have run a perception study on, and nobody seemed to notice it, but that was also spoken stimuli, so I don't know. I've done spoken stimuli with like my own voice and people will like give it all these ratings, which like is my own fault for letting strangers on the internet rate my voice, but none of it is ever correlated to linguistic conditions. They're just like, you sound bad. And then that's it. But um, it would be interesting to do one with um, the particle verb alternation. And what Laurel and I were trying to do is situate it at the end of utterances. So, because we thought people might think of it as something like a strained preposition, which you're not supposed to do. So like I took the trash out versus I took out the trash. And maybe if they hear enough tokens of I took the trash out, um, I have to clean my room up or something, then they would say, actually that person sounds less intelligent. So that, so those are a couple. Mm -hmm. hmm? But those aren't uh, considered to be like social, socially significant, are they? I mean, they're not, the out they're not the super salient. Uh -huh. This is part of the, the reason my dissertation is on negative concord, is that yeah. I had been looking at other less salient variables, and yeah. there wasn't a lot. Yeah. So you might, with other variables that are not as salient, you may just need to do what Andreas brought up and have a couple tokens of them. Yeah. The British English has this, uh, the double object, you know, the 
give it him. Yeah. His, uh, yeah. yeah. Give him, give it to him, give it him. Give him. I know. Him. So, but, but John that. John Stevenson? Is that his last name? John Stevenson uh, was, is, was a student at, at York who was working on that in terms of production. I don't know if he was going to do anything perceptual with it, but. Yeah, that one is interesting, for sure. Yeah, there's, there's not a ton, which is part of the reason I did negative Concord. And, and hopefully looking through like more and more languages, you'll find other things and then people who are good at other languages can also do this sort of work. Yes, Lauren, hi. So I just about the, the double object mm -hmm. alternation thing, I just saw a talk recently at CUNY on the perception of um, the Im implausible ordering of those. And so there, there might be some research. I, I mean, it's not really a socio thing. It's, it's much more of a processing thing. So it was like, give the candle the daughter isn't likely, like it, it's, it's people are more likely to uh, interpret it as either a speech error or to subconsciously reinterpret it in the other way. Um, so I, I wonder how that would work when it was more socially salient as, as like a dialectal, dialectic, dialectical feature. But I'm not gonna worry about that word. Um, <laughs> but there's definitely some psycholinguistic work on how that sort of thing is processed. Okay, that's really interesting. Yeah, it'd be interesting to do, because I guess you'd have to do it in the UK where you have the dialectal variants. Although part of the question that I think is really interesting is how do you evaluate things that just seem ungrammatical to you? Do you assume that like, oh, that, that's just different. Do you just like, do you simply other it and say some people might talk like that, I haven't heard it. Or do you go, wow, that person's dumb. I didn't understand them. And in this experiment, at least for like negative auxiliary inversion, I saw both. Or it seemed like people in the UK were like, what is this, couldn't any, or like, couldn't anybody do this? Or couldn't nobody do this? What is this, this person must be dumb. Or like, I've never heard anyone say that. Or they said like, Americans talk like that. Which is also just an interesting, like how local the indexing is. That'd be really interesting though. Yeah, there's, there's not a whole lot of research on the interpretation of ungrammatical or unacceptable sentences. Cause it's just, it's too hard to find like that sort of test condition to figure it out, to narrow things down. Sure. Which is, yeah. Any other questions for Mary? We, we've gone a good while, so I'm happy to stop the recording and uh, Leave it there unless anyone's got something last minute. Thank you so much. <laughs>